Maurice Merleau-Ponty's theory of perception evolved over the course of his life, but we find some of his most fundamental commitments articulated already in the 1930s in two essays that he wrote when he was only 25 years old. One of these is called A Working Project on the Nature of Perception from 1933, and the other one is a short essay called The Nature of Perception from 1934. In both of these essays, Merleau-Ponty begins articulating his critique with critical philosophy, especially the philosophy of the German phenomenologist Immanuel Kant. According to Merleau-Ponty, the problem with critical philosophy and its understanding of experience is that it remains committed to an essentially Aristotelian framework that divides matter and form. So according to Kant, matter is given through the senses, and that matter is then formed by the activity of the understanding with its categories. But Merleau-Ponty believes that new developments, especially in psychology around the 1920s and 30s, cast doubt on this understanding of perception or experience as something that happens when matter is formed by the activity of the intellect, as Kant would have said. One of these developments is Gestalt psychology. Many of us are familiar already with the notion of a gestaltic shift based on visual illusions. So I assume you remember uh, that drawing very famous of an animal that depending on how you look at it is either a rabbit or a duck and your mind can oscillate between both of these perceptual experiences without the drawing ever changing. Now, the central idea behind a lot of gestalt psychology is that perception is not, as many people believed previously, a matter of the mind registering particulars that have no order and then giving them order through an act of intellectual creation or intellectual production. Rather, already at the level of perception, we perceive holes. There is already a level of structuration that is inherent to the sensible field, to the realm of the senses. And so in Merleau-Ponty's early writings, he takes this notion of a gestalt or of a whole in order to argue that the sensible realm already comes to us with this spontaneous structuration that is imminent to it and that is not the result of an act of the human mind. And he argues that thinking about perception in terms of gestaltic holes that are not the result of the activity of the subject, but rather in terms of the imminent organization of the sensible realm itself, leads us to look at the world of perception and search for those patterns of structuration that don't come from within us, but that are rather given to us through the very realm of sensibility. And so thinking about the perceived world, he argues, we have to understand that matter is never separate from form, but is already formed from within itself. He often uses the metaphor of pregnancy to challenge that Aristotelian distinction between matter and form that keeps matter on one side, namely on the side of the external world, and form on another side, namely inside the creative capacities of the, of the human subject, in order to argue that instead we should think about matter as already somehow pregnant with form. It carries form within itself and form develops out of matter. And so when Merleau-Ponty gets to talking about uh, his theory of perception, he says the perceived world already has necessarily built within it, almost like a pregnancy, certain structures, of which he gives a couple of examples. One of the most important one is the structure of figure versus background. Whenever I look at a field, whenever I have a perceptual experience, it doesn't matter of what, it can be visual, it can be auditory, it can be tactile. It always includes certain figures that stand out from a background. Otherwise, I wouldn't know what to focus on and I wouldn't really perceive any objects. So for example, when I look at my environment, I can focus or look at uh, certain books, or I can uh, focus on perceiving the plant, or I can focus on perceiving the painting. And in all these variations of perceptual experience, there is a constant, which is that one figure stands out of the background and asserts itself without the background necessarily disappearing. The background remains there as the condition for the possibility of my perception of the figure. And so for Merleau-Ponty, every perceptual field has this dynamic of figure and background. Another example that he gives that he takes from the realm of the perception of space is depth. Of course, humans perceive depth. Um, we can tell how far things are in the distance. But depth is a really funny thing because depth is not something that is given in my field of perception as an object of perception, right? I don't see depth as being located in any one place. 
Rather, depth is a feature of the entire scene of its organization. And according to Morley Ponty, the same, in the same way that matter is already pregnant with form, every single visual, in this case experience, is already pregnant with an element of depth. Another final example has to do with the spatial organization of the visual field in terms of up and down, right and left. Now, there is a very clear connection between these concepts that are about orientation and the body, which he will develop in greater detail in his later, more mature writings. But the point that he makes already in the 1930s is that right, left, up, down are not functions of the way in which, say, the light falls on the retina. So he is resisting a hyper-reductive maneuver that we often find in the sciences of thinking purely in terms of the affectation of our organs um, by the external world. Rather, he says, left and right and up and down, they're not features of what happens to the retina in the back of the eye. Uh, they're not even necessarily um, features of the way in which that information is processed either in the eye or in the brain. Rather, as soon as I have a perceptual field, it already has a certain organization that makes me relate to it as having a certain orientation. So it's a given from the very beginning. Now, all of these concepts of up, down, right, left, of depth, of figure and background are all supported by Gestalt psychology. And again, they move us away from the notion that our senses are built up of particulars without order. And that whatever order we find in the perceptual world ultimately comes from our own creative intellectual activity. That's what Merleau Ponty rejects and rejects already from his mid twenties. A second development that Merleau Ponty talks about in his critique of critical philosophy and its commitment to the matter form distinction is our perception of our own bodies. When philosophers classically have spoken about perception in terms of a separation between matter and form. What they usually have in mind is the perception of something external to myself. That's the model that they are implicitly working with. But there are some objects of experience that really highlight how impoverishing this distinction is between matter and form. And the most important one of those objects is our own body. When I experience and perceive my own body, because I am experiencing myself, there's a, a reflexivity to it. It's impossible for me to know where matter and form go one way or the other. Rather, I am an experiencing subject who experiences himself and who in the act of auto experiencing has a certain understanding of my body that is not necessarily the result of that kind of forming intellectual activity that people like Kant will often emphasize. And so it is in our perception of our own body, in our own embodiment, that we come to see the limits of critical philosophy. And already in the 1930s, in these two very early essays, Merleau-Ponty uses an example that he will develop at great length down the road, which is the experience of phantom limbs. Here he refers to them as illusions. We know from medicine that there are cases where, for example, a veteran who loses an arm or a leg in battle will later continue to experience that limb that is no longer physically there as if it were there. So they will continue to try to walk. They will reach to grab for things with their missing limb. And from the perspective of lived experience, that limb continues to be a hunting presence that has um, a certain claim to reality uh, at the level of perception, even though physically it is not there. And Merleau Ponty understood, again, already in his 20s, that there is something deeply significant about this particular phenomenon, because it points to a reflexivity in our experience of ourselves that forces us away from the matter for distinction that has dominated theories of experience and theories of subjectivity for a very long time, at the very least since the early modern period. The third development that Merleau Ponty talks about in these essays is child psychology. Now, for a long time, psychologists and philosophers believed that children are just like adults when it comes to perception, except that they have a weaker intellect and therefore cannot give as much form to the matter that they receive through the senses. So adults and children receive the same amount of information, more or less, but only adults have the cognitive power to take all that information that bombards them from uh, the organs in order to give rise to a complex, rich and textured experience of the world. Rather, children just do a few little uh, mental intellectual acts here and there and end up with a much more 
impoverished perception of the world, but ultimately in the same order as the experience of adults. Merleau Ponty here leans on uh, new developments in child psychology and genetic psychology, most notably Piaget, in order to argue that we have to recognize a different structuration in the perceptual world of the infant and that of the adult. In other words, it's not as if children perceive essentially in the same way as adults, but less. It's rather that there are two different modes of perception, one that is proper to children with its own logic, with its own sense, and that of adults. One example that he uses here is that of objectivity. Many psychologists have argued that children just don't have objectivity because they just don't know how to differentiate between what is true for them and what is true in itself. But Merleau-Ponty, once again leaning on Piaget, argues that it depends on how you define objectivity because, in fact, children do have a kind of objectivity insofar as they universalize their experience of themselves. So it's not that they don't recognize some element of the absolute, but rather that they project from within their experience outwards. And that highlights the extent to which the experience of children is ordered differently but ordered nonetheless than the experience of adults. Now, all of these developments that I've talked about here, Gestalt psychology with its focus on wholes rather than parts, our perception of our own body, which transcends the matter form distinction of Aristotle, and child psychology, which leads us to look for the ways in which different forms of perception have their own order that is proper to them. All of these are used by Merleau-Ponty in order to move us away from the critical philosophy of Kant, which again relies on that matter-form distinction. And Merleau-Ponty draws two main conclusions from these developments. The first one is that we have to find new ways of talking about and thinking about the nature of perception, because the categories that we have inherited from the past just don't cut it anymore. They don't help us illuminate the things that we are learning about perception, especially from uh, new currents in psychology and philosophy. This is why Merleau-Ponty introduces a term that I already mentioned, pregnancy. Instead of thinking about matter and form as two separate entities, what would happen if we thought of them as auto-impregnated with one another, such that there can be no matter without form and no form without matter? The second conclusion that he draws is that this is precisely why phenomenology in the vein of Husserl is so important in the 20th century, because phenomenology recognizes that perception is not about individual particulars that are ordered by the mind, which is how psychologists think about it, and therefore recognizes, and this is an important point, that the world or the universe of perception, as it is lived, cannot be assimilated into the worldview of the natural sciences. We need a new discourse for thinking about perception that doesn't reduce perception to, let's say, physical or psychological givens. And that's what phenomenology tries to do, which is why, in turn, Merleau-Ponty argues that one of the most important contributions of Husserlian phenomenology was its emphasis on newness. We need new ways of thinking about perception because so far philosophy has failed.